So by the 20th century, many of the reforms that began in the 19th century uh, really started to take hold. Uh, prisoners were allowed more freedom. They were given congregation. They were given mail. Um, uh, silence and lockstep marching were no longer the norm. Uh, prison administrators began to segregate prisoners by risk and by individual treatment needs. So you didn't have, you know, you, you didn't have somebody that um, was in for petty theft hanging out with mass murderers. Um, and then the opposition by organized labor ultimately ends convict lease systems as well as forced labor. Restrictions continued to be imposed on prison industries um, from that point on. And by 1900, a number of states had restricted the sale of prisoner-made goods on the open market. Um, we see three trends of the modern era standing out in reference to prison construction. Uh, first, prison prisoner rights. From the 1960s to the 1980s, the courts began granting inmates rights that previously they had been denied. Today, inmates enjoy a broad range of rights, although an increasingly conservative judiciary has curtailed growth of inmate rights um, uh, as well. Uh, prison violence increased. Some of this was due to overcrowding and poor conditions. Uh, the locus of control in many prisons has shifted from the correction staff to violent inmate gangs. Um, Reevaluation of prisons happened from the 1960s to the 1980s. Most prison administrators adopted the medical model, which viewed inmates as sick, sick people who needed treatment rather than punishment. Uh, eventually, uh, disenchantment over the effectiveness of rehabilitation led prison, prison officials to change their focus from rehabilitation to incapacitation. Um, and the pressure on correctional institutions caused by overpopulation uh, became, began to become a burden. Um, when we think about jails, there's five primary purposes of jails. First, to detain accused offenders. Second, to hold convicted offenders uh, awaiting sentence. Third, to confine an offender that's convicted of a misdemeanor. Uh, Four, to hold pro, uh, probationers and parolees arrested for violations and awaiting hearing. And then five, to house felons when state prisons are overcrowded. When we think about jail populations, uh, there are some trends that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the current jail population is about 234 individuals per 100,000, which is down from 2007 where we had a high of 259 per 100,000 people incarcerated. Uh, the recent decrease in jail population may be due to the declining crime rate and an increased use of alternative sentencing. It could also be in, uh, in reference to some changes in laws. There's an argument to be made that the prison population is overpopulated because of uh, many nonviolent drug offenders, especially due to the war on drugs uh, and, and its approach to marijuana. Uh, but we're seeing laws change throughout the land right now. Uh, Oklahoma just uh, let out 100 people this week because their, la their laws in the state had changed. Males outnumber females, of course, um, uh, by a significant margin. But unfortunately, ladies, the, nap is, the gap is narrowing. Um, white males make up about 47% of the population, which still means minorities are disproportionately represented. Black men have an increased likelihood of receiving jail sentences compared to white men and women who commit similar crimes. And differences in the economy means racial differences in the ability to both personally meet bail and qualify for third-party loans. Uh, if you can't pay bail, then you can have a long-term 
consequence in waiting just to uh, go to court. As we mentioned, jail conditions, um, jail funding continues to not be a pri priority. Um, there's no unified national policy on how we have to uh, take care of jails. And many inmates suffer from untreated emotional problems. Um, things that they might have gotten in a larger prison system, but local jails just don't have the ability to do that. Uh, suicide is, of course, a problem. Inmates commit suicide at a higher rate than in the general population um, when they're incarcerated in jails. And a dramatic increase in jail suicide has happened over the last 20 years. We're starting to recognize the problem um, and provide services. And, and this is creating a development of new uh, types of jails as we move into 21st century. Uh, speaking of those new generation jails, the linear design jails required correctional officers to patrol the hallways to supervise inmates. That's the traditional model. The new generation jails are built in clusters or pods, which allow officers to view inmates easily from stationary positions. You get two types of supervision in jails, direct supervision where officers are stationed in direct con contact with inmates, and indirect supervision where officers are stationed in secure places and communicate with inmates through intercom systems. Um, that leads us to prisons. More than 1,700 public adult correctional facility houses, um, uh, state prisoners in the United States. So 100 or 1,700 prisons. About 100 of them are federal prisons. More than 100 are privately run prisons. And they're organized into three three levels, maximum security, medium security, and minimum security. Uh, maximum security prison is a correctional institution that houses dangerous felons and maintains strict security measures. You see high walls, there's limited contact with the outside world. Um, these are probably the ones that you're most familiar with. Those are the ones that we see in um, our TV shows and, and when you think of Alcatraz, this is that type of prison. Uh, designed for security and designed to eliminate hidden corners and passageways uh, which can be easily blocked. Um, there's also a supermax security prison. This is the newest form of maximum security prisons and it uses high levels of security to incapacitate the nation's most dangerous criminals. Most inmates are in lockdown 22 to 24 hours per day. Critics believe these types of prisons infringe on the rights of the inmates. Some research has found elements that enhance the quality of life in these types of uh, prisons, including the increase in privacy, the reduce in danger, and uh, the provision of creature comforts when they're in their solitary confinement. Um, and they also have unintended negative consequences. Staff may have too much control over the inmates. Long hours of isolation may be associated with mental illness and psychological disturbances, and inmates may have a difficult time adjusting upon release. Medium security prisons, these are less secure institutions that house nonviolent offenders and provide more opportunities for contact with the outside world. They're similar in appearance to maximum security, just less security. Um, prisoners are housed in cells, but, um, but honor rooms are uh, used to reward those who make exemplary, exemplary rehabilitation efforts. So they get the opportunity to spend time outside of their cells and they promote greater treatment efforts. Um, and then last but not least, uh, minimum security prisons, well maybe I should say last and least, minimum security prisons, these are the least secure institutions. They house white collar and nonviolent offenders. Uh, they maintain few security measures and have liberal furlough and visitation policies. These have, of course, been criticized for being like a country club. And in fact, some do have tennis courts and pools. <laughs>
you wonder why white white collar criminals get to go here. Um, after a decade of sharp increases, the population is beginning to decline. In 2015, imprisonment rates were 471 out of 100,000. And you ask yourself, well, why the significant drop in crime rates, but no drop in imprisonment rates? Well, much of the population are recidivists. They're coming back to prison. Another reason is that criminal legislation increases carcer incarceration. Um, another thing to think about is the amount of time in prison has increased and a significant association among drug use and drug arrests um, uh, correlate with prison overcrowding. Uh, the profile of a typical inmate, uh, largely African-American male, Gender, about 7% of the population is female. Age, they're relatively long, or young. Um, the offense, half are serving time for serious offenses. Um, what type of social problems? Many inmates suffer from social problems such as undereducation, underemployment, and abuse. This brings us back to that structural element of uh, racism that is embedded in the system itself. Um, some alternative correctional institutions, we have prison farms, and they're generally minimum or medium security prisons that are located in rural areas. Um, these farms produce food and fiber uh, for consumption in the state correctional systems. You have boot camp, a short-term militaristic correctional facility in which inmates undergo intensive physical conditioning and discipline. Uh, they're ultimately going to be phased out due to a lack of evidence showing their effectiveness. And then, in, of course, shock incarceration, a short prison sentence um, served in a boot camp style facility. Um, we also have halfway houses. These are community-based correctional facilities that house inmates before their outright, outright release, kind of easing them way, easing their way back out into society. Um, Despite their promise, the correctional treatment strategy is not always effective. Um, there's often considerable political opposition to halfway houses, particularly for nearby residents. Um, we see private prisons, which uh, vary based on different types of business models. Some private companies build prisons and leave them to the state to run. Some build prisons um, and contract for specific services. Um, and some private companies build and run prisons on a contractual basis. And then, of course, do private prisons work? Recidivism, recidivism rates between inmates housed in private and governmental facilities are similar. However, inmates from private prisons tend to commit less serious subsequent offenses. The reliance on private prisons raises some problems, though. One, will state providers or will private providers be able to evaluate programs effectively? Two, will they skimp on services and programs to reduce costs, which we know happens regularly? Three, might they not skim off of the easy cases and leave the hard ones to the state? So cherry pick the easy um uh, inmates and leave the hard cases with the state. And finally, will keeping business good require widening the net or bringing more people into the prison system uh, at a time when we're trying to reduce that?